Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Please remember, as always, everybody on our uh, continuing prayer list. Um, of course, Chester goes. She said he seems to be doing a little better, so hopefully that medicine is working and getting rid of that blood clot. She's hopeful of that. Um, Jacqueline, of course, is not here today. She told me about all she can do now is lay there and cry. It's about all she can do. She's in so much pain. So uh, she is supposed to have, what's the day, the 10th? So surgery, I think, on Thursday. So let's, let's pray that that uh, they can they can help her and they can do something for her. I, just, I can't imagine. Just keep praying for her. Uh, Marty Hammonds, do have a sort of an update on him, just that they're still running a lot of tests. They, they still don't know yet. Uh, he's got some kind of a nerve issue in his neck and they're trying to figure out a treatment for that, but they've been running and doing blood work and doing a lot of tests on him, trying to figure out how to help him. So keep praying for him. Uh, and then... Uh, Julie told me that John does still have COVID, so he's yeah. still he's still struggling with that. So please pray for John. Hopefully, uh, he'll get better soon. Uh, Lane said Hudson seems to be doing pretty well with his broken collarbone, so we're thankful for that. And still waiting on uh, Spencer, his dad is getting stronger, and they're still waiting for him to get a little bit stronger so they can do that, put that stent in uh, to fix his blockage. So please please pray for him that they can get that done as soon as possible. All right, North Bradley will be having a gospel meeting on March 24th through the 27th. T.J. Kirk will be doing the preaching nightly. There is a, a brochure in the bulletin board up there, a flyer, if you care to look at that. So that's all I have this morning. So we're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl. At the appropriate time, Brother Bobby will have our opening prayer, and then Brother Lane will have our dismissal prayer. Brother Cheryl. Morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Please get your song book and turn to number 425. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. 
big, good neighbors to everyone. And he led us throughout the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blue Charlie Song, book number 387. We'll sign this to for the Lord's Son. Thou at the cross were my Savior died. Thou were from cleansing from sin I cried. There through my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. so many things for granted. Let us not take what Jesus did for us for granted. And Paul's meaning an unworthy manner may have been, may have meant that we may rush into this ceremony without thinking of its meaning. We may forget the sacrifice of Christ on, behalf, on our behalf. We may come to the communion with unconfessed sin. We may allow the sacrament to become a cold, lifeless, formal ritual, just going through the motions. I'm going to read Matthew, the 26th chapter, beginning the 26th verse. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come to your throne, asking you to bless this bread that we're about to break. When we break this bread, we think about the cruelty that was done to our, your son's body upon the cross. We thank you for the, him enduring the pain on our behalf. And as we take this, help us to remember that. In his name we pray. Amen. you to bless 
ask this for the divine. We thank you for this for the divine that we can remember your son and what he did for us. We thank you for the blood that you shed for us. Through that blood, we can have remission of sins if we follow his commandments. And we know following his commandments is not grievous, but a joy for what he did for us. Help us to remember that as we take this for the divine. In his name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of the Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store, as God has prospered him. And there be no gathering when I come. Let us pray. Father God, we come before your, before your throne, humbly thanking you for the so many blessings that you've blessed each of us with. Those blessings are too numerous to, to, to name, but the most important blessing that has been given to us is your son, what he did for us. Help us to share our blessings with others, help us to help others, we know we have that responsibility and help us to live up to that responsibility and go with us in all that we do and help us to remember others as we can give. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please get your song book and cover number 446.
If you would be turning to the book of John, we'll be looking there in just a few moments. Cheryl, did you say 675? Yes. Make sure I have the right one. Want to commend you all for getting the time right today. It's good. Everybody remembered to change their time. Of course, if you're like me, my phone does it automatically. So that helps forgetful people like me. So nice to have that technology. But, and it'll be, actually be daylight when we leave here tonight. So that'll be, haven't seen that in a while. So we're thankful for that. You know, there are times that uh, we need to gain information about someone that maybe we don't know very well. Maybe we are seeking someone to hire for our business or our company, and of course you want to get a good candidate, so you need to know something about that person. Maybe we're seeking a, a good babysitter for our children or our grandchildren. You certainly, you want a reputable person, somebody that you can trust to do that. Or maybe we're trying to find a, a reliable repairman for our refrigerator or whatever, something is broken down in our house, or you want a good auto mechanic to work on your car. So you're looking for somebody that you can believe in, somebody that you can put your trust in, to do whatever it is you need to get done. Well, how do we get this information about people? How do we find out who the best person is that we're looking for? Well, you know, we all have to start somewhere when we want to learn about someone. And a good place is kind of through what we call word of mouth, right? So you could talk to friends of these people or family or former customers, you know, somebody that's that knows this person or they've had some kind of experience with this person, they would be good to talk to. So, well, well tell me about this guy. Is he, is he really a, a good mechanic? You think he could fix my car? Oh, you don't want to go to him. No, he, you know, or, that's what we do, right? So it, it would be good to talk to people that knew this person and they could give you some information. Well, we can look at Jesus the same way. The same way that we would learn, want to learn, or, or want to learn, know anything about anybody else, well, we can do the same thing with Christ. So this morning, what we want to do is just answer that basic question, who is Christ? Who is Jesus that we talk so much about, we read so much about? And what we want to do is look at three different sources. To learn who Jesus is. So we want to answer that question by, number one, we want to ask some of his friends and family what they thought about him. How do they describe him? Secondly, we want to ask some people who have competent authority to speak on this matter. And then thirdly, we want to ask Jesus himself. What, how would Jesus describe himself? What does he say? about who he is. So let's take a look at that this morning. Let's start off with the, the family and friends. So we're just going to look at a couple of examples. First of all, let's think about Martha. You'll be turning to John chapter 11. Now, Jesus was very close to a family uh, that lived in Bethany. And this family, uh, at least what we're told, comprised of three people. And that would be Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Jesus was very close to them. Well, Lazarus, of course, is going to die. He will pass away. And the two girls, the two sisters, send word to Jesus that he's very sick. And you know, we want you to, to come and, and do something. And, of course, in the meantime, Lazarus passes away. And so Jesus comes to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he asked Martha, if she believed in him, did she think he could do this? Which, of course, she did, because that's why she sent for him. But notice her answer to Christ, how she describes him. Look at John 11 and verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, 
which should come into the world. So Martha said, you are the Christ. In other words, you are the Messiah. She believed that wholeheartedly. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. That's how she would describe. So if you and I could talk to Martha today, who is Jesus? That's what she would tell us. Jesus is the Messiah. He is your Savior. He is the Son of God. That's how she would describe him. Well, what about Peter? Peter was another good friend of Jesus, obviously. Be turning over to Matthew chapter 16. We see here the account where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? Just curious, well, what are people saying about me? And so they give him several different answers. Well, some people say you're this guy, and some people say you're this guy. And so then Jesus says, well, okay, but who do you say I am? You, my apostles, who do you say that I am? And so Peter, usually always the, the spokesman for the group, he wasn't too shy about speaking up. Notice what Peter says in answer in Matthew 16 and verse 16. When Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. So Peter described him the same way that Martha did. She said the son of God. Peter said the son of the living God, but obviously they're talking about the same God. But you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of God. So Martha described him that way. Peter described him that way. Let's turn over to 2 Peter. Want to notice what else Peter said when talking to people about Jesus, as we try to figure out who he is. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. And here Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Jesus is not a fable. Jesus is not a fairy tale, a figment of somebody's imagination. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. So Peter's talking about the transfiguration. When he was there and, and, and Moses came and Elijah came, and that's what he's referring to here. But notice how Peter described him, right? He, he called Jesus our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. And he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Well, we associate that word majesty with what? with a king or a queen, right? Royalty. Jesus is king, and Jesus is reigning on his throne as we speak. He is the king, and he reigns over all. And that's how Peter described him. Well, what about John? Let's notice how John described Jesus. Look at John chapter 1. We want to look at verse 1, and then also skip ahead to verse 2. 14. Notice how the Apostle John, who would have known Jesus very well, obviously, how does he describe him? John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice there the Word, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the word was God. Notice how word is capitalized all those times because it's a person. It's not a thing. He's talking about Jesus. Now look at verse 14. How do we know that's Jesus? And the word, capitalized again, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John describes Jesus. He said, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word, and the word was God. So he said, Jesus is God. He is the word. And said, he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And he said, the only way you get that kind of glory 
is to be the begotten of the Father, the only begotten Son of God. Only He could have that kind of glory, and John tells us that's exactly who Jesus is. So we've looked at Martha and Peter and John, three friends, close acquaintances of Jesus. What, a, what about a relative? Well, let's look at his brother, James, his earthly biological brother, also the son of Joseph and Mary. What did he say? Well, first of all, I want to know, how do we know that James is Jesus' brother? Well, take a look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Here's where we first read about that he has brothers. Mark 6 and 3 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So clearly talking about Jesus, they're trying to ridicule a little bit. Isn't he just the carpenter's son, the son of Joseph and Mary and but we notice here that Jesus has at least four earthly biological brothers. So that refutes Catholic doctrine, which said, well, well, Mary always remained a virgin. No, she didn't, because she had other children after. Jesus was her firstborn, but he wasn't, it never says he was her only born. So she has at least four sons, and also multiple sisters we don't see how many but it does say plural his sisters so there's at least two of them maybe more we we don't know but that's what it says and so james is one of jesus's earthly biological brothers look at galatians 1 and verse 19. we notice something else about james which tells us again something about jesus what james knew about jesus galatians 1 and 19 but other of the apostles saw i none say James, the Lord's brother, okay? So James was considered an apostle. He was a follower of Christ as the Messiah. He didn't just consider him just to be his earthly brother, but he was the Messiah. Now look at James chapter one and verse one. We see what James himself says, talking about his brother, Jesus. James one and verse one. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So notice James didn't say, I'm a servant of God and I'm a servant of my brother. He calls him, his brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a term referred or reserved for God. So James, and, and we read earlier in the Bible where his brothers were not necessarily convinced of that early on, but they became believers. They saw the things that Jesus did, and they realized, probably combining that with what their mother told them, I'm sure Mary told them the story of, look, the angel, to, this is how Jesus was born. It was a miraculous conception. I'm sure she had told them all that. And then they saw the things, the miracles that he did. They became believers, and they knew they were convinced who Jesus was. And so James here calls him the Lord Jesus. He's not just my earthly biological brother. He's the son of God. He's, he's much more than just my earthly biological brother. So we see here some accounts of some friends and, and a relative. Well, let's take a look at some competent authority. Who else could tell us who Jesus is and, and describe him for us? Well, what about the angels? What are the angels have to say about Jesus. Well, turn over to Luke chapter 2. Because at the birth, when Jesus was born, they, of course, were visited by an angel of God, and he described Jesus as Savior and Lord. But look at Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So an angel of God is telling everybody, this is no ordinary child that you're looking at here. 
This isn't just an ordinary human baby, but he says this is a savior, your savior. He's going to be everybody's savior. He is the Christ, the Messiah. He is Lord. He is God. That's who the angel is telling them. Well, what about a particular angel? What about Gabriel? What did Gabriel have to say about Jesus? So stay there in Luke. Turn over to chapter 1. Gabriel is one of only two angels that are mentioned by name in the Bible, the other one being Michael. So that tells us something. We're not told a lot about Gabriel, but just the fact that God names him tells us that he must have been an angel of some significance, of some authority. Some people speculate maybe he was an archangel. We know that Michael was because Michael is identified as an archangel, which that means he had authority over other angels. Some people say, well, Gabriel must have been too. He might have been. We don't know. He's not identified as an archangel, but he's the only one besides Michael that is called by name. So again, must be an angel of some significance. Notice what he says about Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 26 to establish this is Gabriel talking. Then we want to notice what he said. So in verse 26, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, now skip ahead to verse 31. And this is Gabriel talking to them. He's talking to Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Notice, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So Gabriel says several things about Jesus. He's going to be great. If an angel of God calls you great, that's something significant. He's going to be great. He's going to be called the son of the highest. Well, who's the highest? It's God the Father. Nobody's higher than God. He said, he, this is the son of God the Father. That's who this is. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Again, some people were going to look at this on Wednesday night. Well, that's he's going to come back and reign on a literal throne. That's not what this means. This is symbolic language, but saying that Christ is going to have authority and he's going to reign, okay? He's reigning on his throne right now as we speak. And so that's how Gabriel described Jesus. Well, let's go even higher than Gabriel. What about God the Father himself? What does he say about Jesus? Well, look at Matthew chapter 3. We notice the account here. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And notice what happens. Matthew 3, beginning in verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Let's stop right there. Again, that shows us you've got to be down in the water. Sprinkling is not going to cut it. You've got to be immersed in the water. Jesus went all the way down in the water and he came up out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven, the voice of God, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So God the Father, he himself calls Jesus, This is my Son. And he says about Jesus what you and I would love for God to say about us. In whom I am well pleased. Okay? That, that's my hope, that's my prayer, that's my dream, that when I come to the end of my life on earth, that God would be able to look at me and say, you know, Mark, I am well pleased with what you have done. Again, not that I could ever earn it, but just that I have tried my best to do what God told me to do, where he would be pleased with me. That, that's what I want. And so this is how God himself describes Jesus, telling us, who he is. Well, let's close out this morning. Let's ask Christ himself. What did he tell us about who he is? Well, first of all, look at John 14 and verse 6. 
These are all things that Jesus said about himself. This is a self, an autobiography, a self-description. John 14 and verse 6, and all these will be in the book of John. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Notice Jesus didn't say, I'm a way. I am one kind of truth. I am some kind of life. That word, the, is there every time. The way, the truth, the life. Saying it is the only one that is acceptable to God. The only way that you and I are going to get to be with God in heaven for eternity is to get there through Christ. He is the way, the only way. The man, uh, men tell us, oh, there's a multitude. We're all going to the same place. We're just going different ways to get there. Jesus right here tells us there's only one way to get there, and that's through him. That's who he is. Well, look at John 11 and verse 25, where Jesus tells us, I am the resurrection. So I am the way and I am the resurrection. John 11 and 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection, the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is talking about spiritual death and those that believe in Jesus that he is the son of God He's saying, I am your resurrection. You can be spiritually reborn, but only through Jesus because he is not a way, he is the way. He is the resurrection. That's who he is, okay? And so we can be reborn spiritually through him and only through him. Now, lastly, notice in John eight fifty eight. notice how Jesus describes himself here tells us something about his nature, his character. John 8, 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, well, before he was even born, before he was conceived, I am. So Jesus is telling us here that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. There's only one creature that is eternal, and that's God. Jesus is God. Okay? You and I are immortal. The angels are immortal. What is that? What's the difference between immortal and eternal? Immortal means that you and I had a starting point. You and I have not always been in existence. We had a starting point, but from that point on, we're immortal. We'll never die, at least not our spirit will never die. We can have spiritual death, meaning a separation from God, but that just means our spirit is going to live on in a horrible place where we don't want to be. So we are uh, immortal, meaning that once we were created, we'll never, we'll, we'll exist somewhere in spiritual form. The angels are immortal, right? They will always exist from the time they were created, but they haven't always been here. They were created beings, so they, they had a starting point. And from now on, through eternity, the angels will be here. Through eternity, you and I will be here. What Jesus is saying is, before anything, I am. In other words, Jesus is God. Jesus has always been here. Jesus was not created. He doesn't have a starting point, just like God the Father, just like the Holy Spirit. Part, all part of the Godhead. God is eternal and immortal. God has always been. God is here now and God will always be. Only God can make that claim and Jesus makes that claim for himself, telling us that he is God. He is eternal. So who is Jesus Christ? Well, he's not a liar, as some people claim. The, the miracles attest to that. He is not a man who was crazy or insane. Some people tried to claim that. He is not a man who was demon-possessed. Some people try to claim that. He, in fact, is no ordinary man. Even when he was here on earth, he was no ordinary man. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's who he is. Jesus Christ is eternal deity. He's always existed. He will always exist. Jesus Christ is 
my Lord. He is my Savior. And he is your Lord and he is your Savior. That's who he is. He is the only way. He said, I am the way. He is the only way to heaven. He is the only way to God the Father. And the only way we get there is through the gift. Nobody else can give this gift, the gift of the blood of Christ, which we just remembered a few minutes ago in the Lord's Supper. That is the way. We have to partake of the blood of Christ. So may we always praise the high and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of the living God. This morning, if you are not a Christian, if you have not obeyed the commands of Christ and you've not been baptized into him, that means you do not have access to the blood that he shed for you on the cross, which we are studying in our Bible study on Sunday morning. You don't have access to that blood. The only way to get it is to be baptized. There's no magical power in the water. It's simply your obedience to Christ. You are doing what he commands you to do. Your sins will be washed away and God will add you to his church. If, on the other hand, you are a Christian, but you have fallen away, you've gone back into the world, you've not been following Christ like you should have, you need to come home. You need to return back before you run out of time. We don't know when time is going to stop. It might be today, for all we know. We don't know when our life is going to end. It might be today. Do not wait until it's everlastingly too late. Make that decision to come home today. You can come forward. We can pray with you and for you. And God has promised he will forgive you for the sins that you confess and you repent of. So if you have a need, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, things that are over my side. I will hasten, hasten to them, hasten so glad. Good to see you all this morning. I hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock. As always, we thank Brother Mark for another good lesson this morning. Be, be thankful each, each time, each and every time that, that he has been a blessing to us. We always need to remember 
each and every one from the prior list because they're sick. Do we remember those who have hardships in their lives? We need to pray for this old, everybody that's living in this old world who lives in today because there's a lot of bad stuff going on around us and a lot more than, than we really know about. We, we need to pray for, for life here on earth while we're here. Always remember, Thursday tonight at 6 o'clock, Thursday Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, Again, Bible study at 9.30 on Sunday morning, regular service at 10.30. Please be here. Please bring somebody with you if you can. Please turn to number 580. Let's sing the first verse of this, and we'll have a closing prayer. <clears throat> this is my Father's world, and to my